Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right, welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast. My name is Randy Smith, and I'm your host today. And I am really excited to have Dan Breesey with us. Uh, Dan is the managing partner of Granite Towers Equity Group. They've got about 3,000 doors and $350 million in assets under management, primarily focused in DFW and Nashville. And something kind of fun and interesting is he was a professional snowboarder for 15 years and participated in the X Games. So, Dan, uh, welcome to the show. Excited to have you here. Thank you, Randy. I'm excited to be here with you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's jump right in, Dan. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, uh, more than the details that I just shared to, to intro you? Yeah, I grew up in a small town in, in central Minnesota with a big dream. I guess, looking back, it doesn't feel as big now, but back then it seemed big of uh, becoming a professional snowboarder. And, uh, you know, found it when I was about 13, 14 years old, got really into it. By the age of 15 or 16, I pretty much had made a decision I was going to do my best to become a professional snowboarder. Um, okay. Didn't really have, yeah, parents that had any money to like supply this sort of dream. So it was really on me. I started working odd jobs in the summer and I would snowboard as much as I could at the local resort called Powder Ridge in central Minnesota. Okay. Graduating from high school, I moved to Salt Lake City. That's where if you want to be a professional snowboarder, Salt Lake City is a place to be. Sure. And I lived there and I, yeah, I kind of had a rude awakening, thought I'd be a professional within a year or two. And it ended up taking four years before I actually okay. ended up signing my first deal with a actual, both a brand. So okay. yeah. I worked and and you probably back. started making tons of money from day one as a professional snowboarder, right? Yeah. Very little, very, very <laughs> yeah. little. It was yeah. a slow process moving up. So, and never, you never actually make a ton of money as a professional snowboarder. I, mean, I shouldn't say it depends what you think the, a ton is, but you're not making like professional football and basketball money. You're making, you know, 500 to a million a year if you're lucky. And okay. you know, how, how long will that last unknown for sure. Depends on, you know, your, uh, your length of your career, but ended up sure. having a, yeah, having a, a, a good run at some contests. I went on, went to the Aspen open. I couldn't go to the, this is a kind of good story for you. I, I couldn't go to the contest because I have the money, but my buddy who believed that I could do well was like, I'll drive you there. I'll pay for your entry fee and ended up paying for me to be in. And it was an open, anyone who's an open can go, you pay two, 300 bucks and you can get in. And yeah. it's two, two runs. And if you do well, you, you don't, podium and ended up winning so that was the beginning nice. of yeah of my career there were like 250 guys out there and, and from that point on i ended up having a pretty healthy snowboarding career almost 15 years and um, wow. yeah, it, was, it was fun and, and so what what aspect of snowboarding because i know there's all different types of snowboarding were you one of these slalom snowboarders or the trick guys or the half pipe guys Yep. I was in slope style first, which is like jumps and handrails. Um, okay. And then I transitioned more to urban. And I, I shouldn't say I transitioned. I always was an urban rider coming out of Minnesota. That's what we had. It's what we were, it. you know, grew up riding. So I was always an urban guy and X Games came out with an event called Real Snow. And there was an event in Dirt Bike called Real Moto, Real Street for Skateboarding and Real Snow for Snowboarding. And yeah. I ended up being invited to that the first year it came out, and I was a part of that six times. So I was in X Games six times, which was kind of, I'd say, the pinnacle of, of the career. Okay. Um, and yeah, ended up winning a couple gold medals, a couple silver medals, and that was that was kind of the peak. So, so from there, were you like, were you thinking, what am I going to do when this is all over? Clearly, you see guys around you that. I mean, you, you don't do this in your forties and fifties, obviously. So there's there's got to be another plan. Did you start thinking about? halfway through the 15 years or what did that look like? Yeah, no, I, yeah, but by year five-ish, I was pretty much terrified of it ending. My career was like, I saw my buddies who became, you know, growing up in Minnesota, they were my heroes and I moved to Salt Lake City and was around enough where I started to get to know some of these guys. Yeah. And I started to ride and travel with them and they became like friends, you know, and they were five to 10 years ahead of me and their careers were winding down and I'd hear the stories or I'd see it firsthand and it scared the crap out of me. You know, yeah. like I'm talking people losing their homes, drug addictions. I mean, one guy, he ended up getting paid two million bucks, traveled the world for two years with his buddies partying, came back with 
tattoos all over his face and said money ruined him. So seeing that, you know, firsthand, I was like, I'm, I'm, I just don't want to have that be me. So I started reading every book I could get my hands on financially speaking, started to listen to a bunch of different podcasts, um, ended up going to a bunch of different, you know, real estate investing seminars throughout the country. And I would do this during my free time in the summer, you know, it's not much sure. to more than summer. Sure. Um, so started doing that. And then, you know, one thing led to another and eventually ended up buying my first uh, duplex in, uh, in Longview, Washington, and then about a nineplex in uh, Chehalis, Washington. Okay. Are you interested in real estate investing, but don't know where to get started or think you don't have the time or money? Are you stuck in your W-2 because the golden handcuffs make it hard to walk away? If this sounds like you, check out impactequity.net and schedule some time to talk with the founder, Randy Smith. Randy went from massive income to leaving his W-2 through passive income, and he can help you do the same. www.impactequity.net. Okay, so why? And yeah. That's right. You ended up moving up to Washington from Salt Lake. Okay. Yeah, very good. So you started small, but you didn't actually stay small for long. So from two to nine, and um, most people start smaller than that. So w- were you thinking from the beginning that you were going to try to create a big portfolio or uh, was there some strategy behind that? I don't, I don't really think that, no, I didn't have that as like, Hey, let's go and start buying bigger property. It was really just, how can I create passive income? What can I do okay. to somehow create some residual income from different assets that would come in no matter what? So when the snowboarding career ended, not if, but when, right? Guaranteed yeah. coming to a close. What can I do? So I'm not back being a buster at TGI Fridays or uh, right. you know, working at Blockbuster. So um, that was really what it was is, uh, you know, multiple streams of income. And what can I do to reduce my tax bill legally through depreciation? And yeah. so those were the two real motivators for me is how do I pay a little less in tax or a lot uh-huh. less in tax legally? And how can I create streams of income so that when my career ended, I wasn't back to zero? Interesting. So now were you able to kind of blend real estate with your career where you were able to take advantage of the tax benefits with the earnings that you might have been making in, in snowboarding as well? Or? Yeah, I, being I, I got married um, at 22 or 23, or somewhat young for being a snowboarder okay. to get married. My wife was also I met her at a restaurant and she just didn't like working there. So she ended up being a real estate professional for us for a few years where she spent Fantastic. a lot of time yeah, working on the properties and managing and helping with the uh, day-to-day activity and, and the accounting. She actually did my accounting for us with the, with the bookkeeping, which was kind of funny to think back to. Um, sure. But yeah, so that's how... That's how we linked that up. And um, yeah, one thing just led to another. And after after buying the Nineplex, I, I ended up buying a 24-unit deal. And then about that time, my now business partner, lifetime, pretty much lifelong friend, he was a snowboarder as well. He went to college and he and his wife came out and were like, hey, what, what have you been up to lately? And I said, I'm buying an apartment. And he was in the process of buying single family homes, a bunch. He was trying to buy like 100 single family homes by the time he was 30. And yeah. I said, suggested we buy an apartment together and we bought one and then we bought another and then we ended up starting our company a few years later. Fantastic. Okay. So Granite, Granite Terrors was, was born, um, you and a buddy from like from high school, from college or when did you guys? Yeah. yeah you guys high school. We went to a neighboring high school, but we, we met snowboarding at the local resort. He was a snowboarder as well. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah so coming from Northern Michigan, I didn't even realize first of all, that there was that there was a lot of skiing in Minnesota. A lot of people don't realize they're skiing in Michigan either. Um, and they're, I mean, comparatively to what we see out here, it's it's not really skiing. Um, but that's interesting to hear uh, that you came from that area. So very good. So yeah, so very interesting. So you guys, um, you guys both had real estate ambitions, and we're both going kind of down your different path. Um, a lot of folks go down that path as a single family. I was the same way. I had, I had decided I was going to need a hundred single family homes. Either that or 50 paid off to kind of support the lifestyle that I wanted. And the thought of doing that after doing just a handful of them, um, you figure out pretty quickly that that is not a way to scale. So so you guys decide to come together. Um, did you go out and buy a big property to start that uh, that business or did you kind of stay in that middle range? We were in the lower, smaller range still. We bought 20 units. Um, he, myself, and one other buddy from high school actually. And okay. then, yeah, then we ended up getting some education on how to actually complete a syndication, a real syndication, and how to raise capital. 
And after going through some significant training with that mentor, we started to look at bigger deals. We bought a 45 unit deal after that. Um, that was in River Falls, Wisconsin. And okay. now sold that deal. Yeah. And then we ended up buying a larger deal, a hundred or no, 86 units, not much larger, 86 units in Cleburne, Texas, which is our second syndication. It's the first mm -hmm. time we raised over a million bucks. I think it was a $2.1 million raise. And okay. um, yeah, thinking back to the time, just being like, how is this actually going to come to fruition, which is pretty cool. Um, and then it just kept going from there. Um, I think after that, we ended up buying a 101 unit deal. Um in New Mexico. And, and, you know, sounds like we're all over the place, which that would be something that, you know, for your listeners right now, I, I would sure. not do it like that again. We would have honed in on one or two markets and really just gotten deep in that market to become an expert in that market. So you're not spending your time traveling and having different management companies and different vendors and different parts of the world. It just makes it more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, ask that as well. So I'm, I'm assuming you guys are not property managing these yourself you're using third-party property management yeah that's correct we use third-party management we do the asset management with them and you know it's somewhat time intensive as well you know when mm -hmm. we buy a deal we're over here creating a vision we're we're creating a, a blueprint if you will of where we're buying the deal and how we're going to move the needle with a value add play okay. and we're building that out before we close and we're building that based off the debt, based off of the CapEx budget. And then when we close, it's our job to educate and assist the property management company to execute the play as we see fit based off our value add strategy. So no, we're not doing the day-to-day -day management, but we are overseeing the big CapEx jobs and just kind of the, the KPI, you know, weekly, weekly overview of the deal. Okay. So now I, I know a lot of times, generally we see partnerships come together. One might focus on acquisitions. One might be the asset manager. Do you guys divvy up the responsibilities amongst yourself or are you both involved pretty heavily with all aspects? Yeah, we've since in the last, call it six months, have really split into two roles. And it just kind of ended up happening due to our interests and how sure. we behaved as the business grew. And I, I'm more of a... Um, what do we have? Take care of it. I feel is a sense of like, oh my gosh, we have it. Take care of it. Protect it. And yep. I feel like Mike's more of a blazer of like, let's keep going and, and bring in some <laughs> new stuff, some new product. And so sure. it fits pretty well. So Mike's been more of the acquisition, finding the next deal with that part of our company. I've been working more with our company of what do we got? How do we take care of it? How do we, you know, execute our business plan, some of that. So more asset management on the day to day, more acquisitions from Mike. Okay. And then, so in what's the, what's the team look like today? Is it just the two of you guys or is there a broader team behind uh, Granite Terrace? Yeah. So we have a full-time accountant. We have one full-time asset manager. We have one okay. full-time yeah, director of relations for investors. We have one okay. full-time business develop development officer, and we have a couple um, VAs in the Philippines okay. that help with the back office work. And then we have one gentleman out of college who's kind of an intern who's nice. helping out with some marketing. So that's that's okay. kind of our setup right this moment. We are actually looking to hire a few more people here in the next six to 12 months. So, um, okay. but, but we're relatively small still. Okay. Yeah, very good. So you guys were buying, um, you were buying assets kind of all over the place, it sounded like. Um, Wisconsin to New Mexico to Texas. And it sounds like you've honed in on Nashville and DFW. What was it about those two markets that really drew your attention? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Dallas, Fort Worth and Nashville are the only two markets we're looking to buy in right now. Um, number one, both markets that are easy to get to. We don't mind visiting. We like to visit. Um, you know, we're there a lot. We're in Dallas a lot already just with the relationships we have. Sure. Um, Nashville is great city to visit great to uh great to get to so really that was the beginning of it and then after that you know landlord friendly business friendly states great job growth massive population growth and just overall um in certain pockets some really strong demand for apartments that um you know can use some good value add strategies yeah. so it fits our model really well yeah, I like I like that you say um, that you shared the, these are areas that you like to visit. Um, my wife and I, when we started uh, buying, we bought in Kansas City and Atlanta. And we just we really enjoyed Atlanta. It, it helped that you know all the metrics were pointing to a, a thriving market there. But if you're going to be traveling to these markets over and over and over and over again, 
um, it makes sense to be here is where you want to be hanging out, especially if, uh, you know, it, yeah, I, I mean, these aren't lifestyle businesses necessarily, but uh, certainly you want to enjoy where you're visiting while you're doing the work. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I, I've personally invested quite a bit in Dallas and um, Nashville. I've invested in one deal and would, would like to do more there as well, because just all of the metrics are pointing um, in the right direction for everything there. So very good. Yeah, yeah you bet. So, so let's see here over. Um, so you're 3000 doors now, um, which is a, a significant, obviously organization that you built and rather lean. It sounds like from the headcount standpoint, um, when you're looking at the current portfolio, you are a little more spread out. So I'm curious, we've been through some challenges over the last couple of years with interest rates and, you know, expenses just exploding. How is the current portfolio performing today? Is it uh, performing as planned or are there, uh, you know, some other nuances there that you care to share? Yeah, biggest lessons for sure it are, you know, with your debt, what debt are you going to be using? And... Do you have the pockets to withstand what we've gone through, which you got into bridge debt, variable rate debt, those yeah. interest rates have moved massively. And if you bought rate caps and they're tight enough spreads, you're probably just fine. As long as you've got deep enough, deep enough pockets, you keep buying, keep extending as long as the lender will work with you. Um, but yeah. that's been our, I would say my biggest lesson in the last two years is just, you know, what's, what's your model and where are you in the real estate cycle? And if you don't know where you are about, and I'm not saying you're going to know exacts, like this is exactly where we are in the real estate cycle. I'm not right. saying that, but sure. I'm saying you have a good understanding of based off of the U.S. real estate cycle, where are we and what might be coming and then set your debt up based off of that. That's at least how we've done it. That's how we've, that's our new principal, I guess, model. And, you know, we like five and seven year debt, seven years, pretty much ideal in our book. And yeah, you might hold a little right. longer. You may have a little bit more of a prepayment penalty, but it just helps me sleep better at night, you know, and a fiduciary role like we're in and where we've got hundreds and hundreds of investors and like 125 million of capital that we're managing. That's just what makes me feel good. And I, yeah. I would also say that, you know, I, I got into the multifamily game, like I said in the beginning, for passive income and depreciation and nothing's really changed. I'm I love passive income and, and the flip idea of in and out in two years or three years can be profitable. Sure, if you hit the market right, you get the debt right and you got a upward cycle, you could potentially move move the deals pretty quickly. But um, our play is a little longer term, I think five, seven years. Um, yeah. You know, if you get a pop early and you got to pre the, pay the prepayment penalty because someone's going to overpay for your deal, all good. You can re readjust your capital at that time. But what really ends up happening is that you're constantly just in transaction mode with every deal. You buy a deal, yeah. you flip it. Now you got a bunch of cash, which is great. Not all investors are happy about that, by the way. Right. And then you got to find something and you got to go straight back to the drawing board. So, you know, a little slow it down a little bit would be my perspective. And everyone did so well in 2020 and 2021 and early 22 because the cycle was peaking and everyone yeah. thought they were geniuses. And really, it wasn't that you were a genius. It was that the market was going into a bubble. And when it was yeah. bubbling, you thought you were smart when really you were just in the right part cycle timing. So I think that'd be the you know biggest lesson. And, and yeah, coming back to like location, you know, we bought a deal in New Mexico in a location that's oil driven. And mm -hmm. gosh, the, when, when oil's good, that deal is doing good. Like right now the deal is doing good because oil's in steady demand and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's in a great spot. But when we bought it, went through COVID, I mean, our occupancy went from a hundred percent occupied to, you know, these major rent bumps to 50% occupied. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you, you just have to uh, understand the different markets will dictate what your asset will do. And we can only control the asset. I can't control the sub market. And, you know, you hear that yeah. all the time. But that's just the truth. So just do yeah. your dang due diligence on the sub market and make dang sure you understand what jobs will be there in a recession and, and, and who your demographic profile is living at your apartments and what will happen during a recession. And it's been amazing to watch, you know, over the last five, seven years, it's been, we've had a front row seat because we do weekly calls on every single deal we own in every part of the country. Sure. And during COVID, you, could, you could see during COVID, yeah, our New Mexico deal flopped while, meanwhile, some of our Dallas deals went bananas. And so yeah. it's just location market and every deal is different and you just got to know your market and you got to know what's coming. Yeah, I love it. I, I heard somebody on another podcast say, let's let's be careful not to confuse brains with a bear market. 
And, uh, you know, there were a lot of people out there that were walking around with really, really big egos because they happened to be at the right place at the right time. But, um, you know, as they say, as the tides go out, we'll see who's, uh, who's swimming without, uh, without swim trunks, essentially. And there's, there's a lot of folks out there that are doing that. So yep. well, very good. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's an awesome journey. How many, how many years have you guys been in the space? When did you start buying multifamily? yourself yeah so i bought my first deal in 2012 2013 uh, okay but our company was originated in 2017 so okay. we've been we've been after it pretty heavily since 2017 and you know looking back it would have been great to pause buying in 21 into early 22 sure. and or exit most deals at that time and then now you're you know coming back into the market anytime now i think you're in a pretty safe spot debts reset you know, cap rates are high, you're buying in a totally different market. And that's something that I think the listeners need to really hear right now is that if you're investing today, looking at how your deals were two years ago, you're missing the boat. You can't yeah. be doing that. You know, and you're really the, the scary time to be investing was in 21 and 22, which is when everybody was having this huge capital gains because these deals were turning. So they yeah. were throwing everything back in, expecting it to continue to go. That was the most dangerous time to be buying, period. No question about yeah. it. The people's yeah. peak of cycle. So as things have been resetting and interest rates have been going back up. Now, if you think interest rates are going to continue to rise from here quite significantly, then you may want to hold. But if you think rates are getting to the top ish and you see the economy starting to slow down and job reports are starting to come in, like we're seeing, it's likely that, you know, the bottom or the, the peak of rates is likely in and, and cap rates have, have adjusted pretty significantly already. They may do a little bit more over the next three to six months, maybe a year. But I think you're mm -hmm. pretty dang close to be able to open up the you know back of the truck and start buying. So, what are your thoughts on? I, I know everybody's talking about um, you know the Fed's potentially going to be dropping the interest rates 25, 50 basis points. Um, obviously, that ties to ten year in the the loans that that you guys can be getting on these assets. But a lot of people don't talk about the fact like when when the Fed actually starts to cut rates, generally that's because bad things are going on in the economy, which have some cascading effects into multifamily as well. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Well, we're all hoping to see the rates come down for our refinances, but what kind of consequences can we see because of what's driving the need to drop the rates? I think it'll depend massively for location and who your demographic is you know okay. and are you in an a-class deal with a bunch of product coming online right now potentially could affect your a-class deals it just depends real estate is local you know to say yeah. just blanket across the country if this is how it's going to be really difficult and impossible in my book to be able to say yeah that's how it's going to go when i look at our portfolio you know i i look at deal by deal basis who's our demographic What's the occupancy of the submarket, and what are the main jobs and drivers of that submarket? And if I feel and we can see that everyone's ninety six percent occupied, delinquency's low, and they're still handling rent bumps right now, I would hope over the next twelve to twenty four months, as we see whatever comes, and you know construction starts to pick back up and building starts to happen again, which is the only thing I could see happening because we're going to have this lag come, right? All this new product got built and it's coming online and then yep. there's not gonna be much new product. So that's just the cycle. And when yep. that cycle happens, did you underwrite occupant, uh, vacancy and delinquency correct for a pullback? Do you have enough cash if you have some lean months or a lean year to get you yep. through it before you can start raising rent? So biggest thing for me is is your dang sub market. What's that occupancy like? Who's your demographic? And then what's your debt yeah. leverage? Yeah. I, and I think the demographic thing is such a big thing. We're seeing all of the headlines about layoffs now, but layoffs are occurring with large fortune 100, 200 companies. They're occurring in technology. They're probably not renters in your B minus, um, maybe even B um, asset classes. So, you know, it, I think it's possible that those people are getting hit now. Who knows what that'll bring in the, the coming months if we see employment continue to weaken. Um, but yeah, I think in that B class value add space, that is that is the smart place to be. The A's are getting hit. We're seeing it. So, um, okay. So you guys are, I suspect, in based on what you shared here today, you guys are in acquisition mode. So what are you guys seeing out of the marketplace? Are you starting to see some distressed properties or distressed um, operators hit the market? People have been talking about this for two years. When's it going to come? You know, are, are banks still extending and pretending? Or are we starting to see some stuff hit the market? 
if from my perspective, you're seeing all of it already. You know, you're, okay. we're buying from people who need to get out of bridge debt or you're getting broker calls saying, hey, they'll take it for the debt. You know, like wipe, wipe the equity, just take it for what the debt is. And you're, you're getting that stuff coming online and now it's saying, hey, we'll take it for less than the debt even. So you're seeing that already in the market and you've got huge firms, you know, coming in and buying massive, massive portfolios. Uh, BlackRock, I just read put 10 billion in and bought, was it, was it 76 apartment complexes? So, you know, yeah. the, the, the window for buying is open. If you've got a reputation and if you can be a firm that can close deals, the challenge most people have right now, I, from my perspective and what I'm hearing is just raising the equity, which is yeah. too bad because, you know, from, from what we're seeing when we're raising capital, we just got done raising capital on our most recent deal we're closing on next week is that a lot of the folks that are investing now are people who are wealthier. And the mom and pop folks who were investing, you know, because they had a bunch of deals turning now are on the sidelines. So it's, it's hard to see a little bit for me coming from that yep. middle class, you know, way I grew up is that the people who have extra cash now are the ones who are getting into some of what I think may be the best deals you'll see over the next, you know, three to five years. So, but it doesn't mean you can't you know, have a deal or two turn and mm -hmm. get in. Oh, it's not, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to happen quick. It's this real estate's a slow, the cycle takes a while, it takes years and um, yeah. just get prepared best you can and just keep watching and keep getting familiar with the right general partners and pick the right deal and, and get back in when you're ready. So I, I think it's exciting, exciting time. I love the, where the leverage is at. We're not mm -hmm. competing with other people buying bridge debt because it's really difficult right now with bridge. I mean, mm -hmm. from what I, and I haven't looked at a lot of bridge lately, but last I heard that rates were, were challenging and it was difficult to make the numbers work with bridge. So most of it is that Fannie Freddie debt, and um, which is what you know we've been using. Yeah. And so I'm curious on that, on the five or seven year, my understanding on the seven, the prepayment penalty or the yield maintenance at year four quite often can make sense if the numbers are, are right, because you only have one year of, of yield maintenance, I believe, or prepayment that you got to deal with. Is that kind of what you're seeing as well? Would you agree with that statement? Or Yeah, totally will depend what rates do after you close. So, you know, if you buy and rates drop, your payment prepayment penalty with yield maintenance is going to go up and depending on how much time you have. So it. it all depends. I, you know, uh, going back to what I'm looking for with our investors and for me is a little longer term play. And if you get an early pop because someone's aggressive and buying and you can handle the prepayment penalty, all good. Part I don't want to be in and I don't enjoy being in is, hey, we've got to do a uh, capital call here to extend this or, hey, we're going to have to sell early for, you know, potentially, you know, just your money back or a loss. So um, yep. those are those are the scenarios that I, I'd rather just be in a position where you can choose to sell instead of be forced to sell. And that means maybe a little less gain on some deals. So be it. Um, but, you know, stay, steering clear of the of the I've got to sell now and I'm in a. I'm in a tough spot. Yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, people got really used to those two or three year turns. Um, and that's just not how generally, if you take a look historically, that's not how people um, grow wealth over time. The, 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 those are, are kind of fun situations to be in when they last, but um, a lot of people got burned in that area as well. So, yeah, well, very good. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Your current portfolio seems to be performing well. Certainly, you've had had some challenges with some assets, just like everybody did who bought during that time period. But I think you mentioned something that was really important. Um, working with operators that have deep pockets that can kind of weather that storm can be the difference as to whether you see capital calls or whether you see deals going back or, or getting put on the market. So um, I think it's really important to work with folks that have been in the space for some time and certainly yourself being around for a decade plus, um, that, that certainly has helped. So now when you guys are, are you, is there anything that's on the table? I know you're, you work in the 506B arena, so we can't certainly talk about details, but um, do you expect to have some new offerings that are coming to the market here soon? Yeah, I hope by before year end we have one more. Um, okay. We only we only have bought one deal this year, which is you know it's it's just been there's been some challenges to buy. Yep. There's been yep. challenges with saying yeah this is something we'll go after or you know there's a difference of what 
buyers are willing to pay and sellers are willing to sell at. So that gap can be uh, a little bit challenging to get around right now. Um, but I do hope that we have one more before year end. And, you know, for folks that do want to invest, step one is you got to get to know us. Um, you got to be on our mailing list. So like Randy was saying here, we'll do 506B. So they're personal relationships. These are all folks that Mike and I have gotten to know or someone on our team has gotten to know that works at Granite Towers. But, um, you know, getting connected with us, we can, we can listen to our podcast, but a phone call or a couple of emails just so we understand who you are and what you're looking to do is, is the most, the safest way to go for sure. Yeah. And, and transparently, the reason um, the reason Dan and I actually are talking today and actually had had previous conversations over the last week or two is I was introduced to him by somebody that I, I know, like and trust. So um, certainly connect with Dan, do your own due diligence, but he comes well referred to me, which is why I'm trying to build the relationship, because I think there's some option for impact equity to be working with in the future. So, well, Dan, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on and uh, allowing us to get to know you a little bit more. Um, yeah, I appreciate everything that you shared for sure. Yeah, glad to be on. I appreciate you having me again, Randy. Awesome. Well, we do have a few questions I'd like to ask everybody if you got a few more minutes. So we'll run through those real quick and get to know you a little bit more. Yeah, let's go. All right. So as you know, this podcast is geared towards the new or the newer um passive investor. And uh, we're always trying to educate and inspire the new passive investors. So are there special educational resources that you would suggest to the newer, newer passive investor to either start or continue their journey? Yeah, there are several. Um, you know, there's several podcasts, um, but specifically speaking for a passive investor, I, I would, what I would do is I would get to know some general partners by this through this podcast and I'd start yeah. to do research on them, you know, and get to know them, get to know their track record, ask for referrals, ask, ask for the folks who've invested with them. Like, how have you done? How have, how has it been? You know, mm -hmm. what, what, what has gone well, what hasn't gone well. And hopefully those referrals will just open up for you and tell you the truth. Cause that's all you're looking for is a place that's takes care of your capital and helps to make it grow. Um, we do have a book on our website at GranitaurusEquityGroup.com. It's the four steps to successful passive investing. It's just a basic thing to be, or ideas to be looking at. And um, yeah, again, I would I would be all over these podcasts, people you're having on. Uh, Randy, if you get to know, your listeners get to know you and you you do due diligence on these team members, then like you just said a second ago, yep. don't go and do your own due diligence and just see if the track record lines up with what you're looking for and, and build that relationship out. The biggest thing for sure is your relationship with these folks and that you've got experienced, educated, good, honest people that are doing the best they can. Nothing's worse than putting your capital in some, something that, A, the market's already against you. Now you got some general partners who are doing something illegal. I mean, that's just unacceptable. Yeah. And unfortunately, it does happen in this uh, industry and you've got to do the do, due diligence to make sure that you're investing with the right people. Yeah, I say it time and time and time again, like get to know the operators that you're working with, spend time with them, watch them like over time consistently. Uh, anybody can show up for one podcast or or one interview or one presentation, but watching people consistently over time, they're going to show their true self, um, which which yeah. is always the best way, I think. So, yeah. And another point that I, I thought of as you're talking, Randy, is you can get on our mailing list or I'm sure several other folks and you can watch a few of their deals. Like you don't have yep. to invest right out of the gate. You can watch uh, some of our investors watch three, four, five deals come through the pipeline and they see every deal similar. And after enough time of our podcast or phone calls or due diligence, you start to get the feel of like, okay, I'm ready to give it a shot. So nothing, yep. nothing, there's always another bus coming. This isn't the last deal. There'll always be another deal coming. Yeah. And, and actually I would caution people from, if it feels like it's the last, last bus, then maybe run because of the guy who's pushing too hard for this deal right now, uh, for somebody that's not ready to move forward, that's always a red flag for me as well. So, um, Dan, any, any podcasts that you're listening today, um, uh, maybe, um, uh, either for fun or for business growth, uh, that you're using yourself? Man, I haven't been listening to a ton of podcasts recently. I do have a few audio books that I've been listening to. Um, but I, I would say the podcast that I've listened to probably the most would be Ken McElroy's podcast or his okay. YouTube channel. Um, I've always enjoyed what Ken's had to say and, and, and can see uh, some similarities of his focus and what I, what I value as far as passive income and a little longer term hold goes. So Ken's got yep. a great YouTube channel. 
Yeah, and he's uh, he's a conservative, um, seven ten year debt guy that uh, has been around for decades. So yeah, that right. seems to match very closely with what you're doing. So yeah, okay. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about due diligence. So I'm curious are there are there due diligence questions that maybe are not you know something you'd find in a Google search of top ten questions? Are there some that people should be asking that they're not when they're doing due diligence on operators or deals? Well, if you're an operator like we are, you should just be doing such a thorough inspection of the entire asset inside and out and the financial inspection um, inside and out. But if you're a passive investor, you know, if I'm looking at a deal, I'm first doing due diligence on the general partners. And if mm -hmm. maybe that's your question. You're, are you geared more towards that of what's the due diligence to do on a general partner or do you mean on a deal? Either, either or. So okay. the passive investor that's looking yeah. at the partner's deal. Yeah. 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 If I'm a passive investor, I'm first doing my due, before I'm even considering a deal, I'm just doing due diligence on that group, uh, yeah. on that, on that general partner. And three to six months of due diligence is not out of the question in my book. Get on their mailing list, see what content they're pushing out, watch a few deals, talk to a bunch of referrals, watch a couple more yeah. deals. That would be step one for me. Then once I feel enough trust is created with the general partner, then I would you know, potentially when watching their webinar, if I have any concerns, it would be just how much CapEx did they account for? And if I talk to the general partner, you know, tell me exactly what you did to do due diligence so you guys know better than the owners. Because at the end of the day, when you're buying a deal, we know that deal better than the owners do because we just went through everything inside sure. and out. And sure. they haven't done that in probably three to five years. So you, we have the best picture of the asset and you should be able to answer pretty much any question about any thing what plumbing fixtures light uh interior foundation windows roof you know landscaping any of that you should know it perfect and you should have a a, a number of what that's going to cost over the next five years and if you need to put money into it it should be budgeted right there yeah. before you go in so that you're not caught with your pants down so um those, <laughs> those would be, i'd be tuning into is once i've decided on the general partnership group then i would understand what their process is like and i might even be figuring that out when i'm doing due diligence on the general partnership group Love it. Yeah. Great, great feedback. Thank you. All right. So a couple of fun questions to wrap it up. One, um, do you have a recent bucket list item that you've checked off your list or one you're hoping to in the near future? Re recent bucket list item. I, I don't know if it was a bucket list item necessarily. We were in Alaska okay, and we went fishing um, with Rod and Reel for salmon and it was my two boys and I, and it was just a blast. Um, Fantastic. You know, yeah, it was a great memory. They had a great time. We we all caught two fish. We maxed out our limit. It was only one day. I have a broken leg right now, so I couldn't get out there repeatedly. But man, if we were when we go back up next time, my wife's got family up there. We're gonna go fishing consecutively day after day for a, a, a week or so. Very nice. It sounds like a bucket list item to me. Definitely yeah. awesome. Yeah. Very cool. And then a last question: If Dan, you had a hundred grand, you had to invest um, in the next week of your own money and you could not put it in one of your own deals, where would you put that capital? Probably Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Okay. I don't get that a lot. So you're you're uh you're a fan of Bitcoin and where it's going in the, the next handful of months? Yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of where our currency goes and okay. I, I love that it's decentralized. Uh -huh. Um, and no one controls it. And, um, that, that makes me feel better. And now I, keep in mind, I, I, I would do the hundred grand based off of my net worth and liquidity, but I wouldn't do that if this was all I had, or if it was my last hundred grand. So, yeah. you know, that I want to make sure, make sure that's heard that this would be more of a, um, of, uh, this would be more of a speculative play and I've got okay. some funds already invested in, in some very, I would call safe assets with sure. cash flow. So <laughs> I threw that out there pretty quick without any context, but that's yeah. based on where I'm at. That's probably what I do. Or I'd, I maybe do like, you know, half of it into Bitcoin and the other half into gold and silver. I'm, I like gold and silver too. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I like the answer. And I think, and thanks for adding the color as well, because uh, a lot of people, they're playing with different size buckets. So um, I like to look at allocation percentage and percent uh, exposure to certain markets and asset classes. So um, that all makes sense. So yeah, thank you for that. I haven't heard that. And um, I, I don't know anything about Bitcoin other than what I hear. Um, 
which is literally nothing. So I have yeah. not gone down that path at all. So, well, very good, Dan. Well, this is this has been a lot of fun. It's been good to get to know you more. Um, I'm sure we're going to be talking more and more. Actually, I think we might be talking tomorrow um, for another something else on our calendar. But um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Randy. Appreciate your time. Awesome. All right. And to the audience, as always, we encourage you to continue your uh, education journey in passive investing. More important than that, we actually encourage you to make the decision to make your first passive investment. Uh, both Dan and I are convinced that once you do, you will wish you would have started that much sooner. So uh, thanks again for joining us again today. And uh, be sure to join us again next Thursday for another great episode. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.